As Paul concludes his letter to the Romans, he shares the importance of maintaining unity as a church community and shares about his own ministry, closing with thankfulness and greetings to all who co-labor for Christ's kingdom. We've been journeying through the book of Romans, Paul's epistle to the believers at Rome, and we have just landed on the runway, and we are taxing in to our terminal. This is the last message in this series. We're going to complete chapters 15 and 16 today. So if you have your Bibles, that's where we will go to Romans, the 15th chapter. Uh, we will go through chapters 15 and 16 this morning. Um, this is uh, the concluding part of this episode, so uh, uh, we're not going to be spending too much time. Paul is just bringing part of what he's written to a conclusion here. But um, just for the sake of review, I'll just quickly run through what we've seen so far as we've journeyed through the book of Romans. Paul's epistle to the, to the believers at Rome is, is an amazing spiritual journey. Starting in chapter 1, and he talks about creation and creator. And then bringing in this whole, the whole awareness that we are all sinful people. And then in chapter 2, telling us that by the keeping of the law, none of us can save ourselves. Coming in through chapter 3 where he says, look, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. What's, what, what hope is there? And then from verse 22 of chapter 3, he begins by saying, thanks be to God. We are justified freely by grace. And he takes us into that understanding of how God, by grace, forgives us our sins and brings us into right relationship with Him. So chapter 4, the emphasis is on righteousness that comes by faith. Just faith. Righteousness. And he says this was even in the Old Testament. So he refers to two people in the Old Testament, to Abraham and David, and says, look, even they receive righteousness by faith. Chapter 5, he contrasts life in Adam, life in Christ. In Adam, we are all dead. Because sin came in through him and death passed and all. But in Adam, but in Christ, we receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. That's chapter 5. So he brings us to that wonderful standing in grace. Romans 5 verse 1. But then having experienced all that, how do we live the Christian life? That's the rest of Romans. So chapter 6, 7, and 8, he tells us, he deals with the very first thing uh, that, 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 uh, you know, that challenges all of us. What do we, how do we deal with sin in our lives? And so he tells us, Romans 6, God dealt with sin on the cross. The power of sin was broken. Romans 7, he recognizes the struggle we all have that you know, sin still pulls on our flesh, our, on our on, on our bodily appetites and our desires. So how do we then walk in the reality of what was accomplished on the cross? Chapter A. Walk in the Spirit. So you walk in the Spirit, you and I, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Then chapters 9, 10, 11, a theological detour he takes. It's not necessarily a detour, but an explanation saying, okay, just pause there. Let me tell you what God is doing on the earth right now. And he's dealing with the Jews and the Gentiles. He says how right now God has opened the door to the Gentiles. And he's gathering us all in. Come on in. Come on in. And then he's going to turn his attention back to the Jewish people. And gra graft them back into his plans and purposes. And the emphasis in those three chapters is all this was God's plan even before time. That means God planned all of this and he's just carrying it out. He's just unfolding it now. He predetermined. He knew these things ahead of time and he's unfolding it there. Then he gets back in chapter 12 onwards to talk about our Christian life. We are saved. We are living life that overcomes sin. How do you live that life on from there? He says you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You renew your mind. You walk according to the faith God has given you. Uh, we are all part of the body, so exercise the gifts, the membership gifts, and the function that God has for each one of us. You all remember that? 
I'm just, just reviewing, okay? Uh, uh, that's Romans 12. And then he says, okay, now how do we live together as a community? So be hospitable to one another. You, you uh, love one another. Don't keep accounts of evil done to you. Overcome evil with good. Right? The Romans, end of Romans 12. He continues on Romans 13. He talks about how we relate to government authorities. Uh, we respect them. We pay our taxes. Uh, we walk in love. Love is keeping of the law. The last part of Romans 13, he talks about how we awake out of sleep and awake to righteousness and do not sin, make no provision for the flesh. That makes you live a life overcoming in the flesh. And then he comes into chapter 14 where he leaves the two main things. One is respecting each other's preferences. He says, you know, there are some people who eat everything and some people who eat only vegetables. Some people who regard all days the same. Some people who regard certain days uh, as very special. So we all have our preferences. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. But we respect each other's preferences in these kinds of things. And so in the latter part of chapter 14, he says, So now don't let your preference become a stumbling block or an offense to your other brother. So you've got your freedom. But your freedom ends when it becomes, starts becoming an offense to the other person. You're with me? So that's where we stop, Romans 14. So this morning, let's pick up there, Romans chapter 15. We'll start from verse 1. So in this early part of Romans 15, he's continuing with that same thought that he uh, finished in chapter 14. And of course, we know that Paul didn't write in chapters and verses. It's, it's just for our convenience and we've broken it down. So it's a thought that continues. So let's read Romans 15, 1 through 7. and just point a few things out and we keep moving through. Romans 15, 1 through 7. We then, who are strong, are to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each one of us please his neighbor for his good leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So he's continuing with what he has said in chapters 13 and 14 of how we live together. And yet he's saying, you know, let's bear, that is, let's help carry, let's put up, with each other's weaknesses or scruples, or the Greek there literally means uh, a, a difference in thinking. A, a, actually, literally means a lower level of thinking. It's not to put anybody down, but they just think differently. Some people think at this level, some, some people are thinking at a different level. And so we bear with those weaknesses, with those different levels of perspectives on things. Bear with one another and please one another. That means do what will make each other good, happy. And let us edify, build up one another. So this is what our objective is. So this is how we interact with people. In our interactions, we keep these things in mind. You know, that person may not be thinking or seeing things at my level. It's okay. And let me do what will edify that person. The word literally means like an architect in, our, in construction and building a building. So let me do things that will build that person up. And let me do things that will please that person. Let me bless that person's life. And he says, even Christ did not please himself. So look at the Christ. Look at Jesus' example. He didn't do it because I feel good. No. He did what he took the reproaches that came against him. So that he could be a blessing to others. And what Paul is saying here is, 
after he mentions Christ, and he's quoting from Psalm 69, verse 9, he says, look, even Jesus did what the Old Testament scripture is saying, and now he tells us, see, these things were written, meaning the Old Testament scriptures, were written for our, ex as examples to us, so that we, through the comfort and patience of the scriptures, we could be built up. That means these things that were being taught were already there in the Old Testament scriptures. It, is, it was already there. And we learn from those things. So whatever is written in the Old Testament is not for us to be ignored. It's for us to draw strength, uh, lessons from, just like Jesus did. Are you with me? Right? So we don't disregard the Old Testament. We learn from it. And we follow it, just like Jesus. But it's teaching us these very things. Now, why do we, why is Paul emphasizing all of this and how we relate to one another? Why respect each other's preferences? Why don't let your, why we shouldn't let our freedom become a stumbling block to others? What's, what's, what's he after? He says this, so that we may all be like-minded. That we may all, with one mind and one mouth, glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's he getting at? He's getting at, us being a community of believers who are like-minded, one mind, one mouth. Meaning, a community where we are all flowing together. We may have difference in preferences. We may have difference in, 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 in how we look at things, perspectives, but that does not separate us. We are still able to walk together in one mind, like-minded, and with one mouth, glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you with me? So all that he said in chapters 13 and 14 is building up to this. And I want you to keep this in mind because he's going to come back to this in Romans 16, the next chapter, and the 20th verse. He's going to bring this thing up once again, and then he's going to tell us how that affects us as a community. So keep this thought in mind. Paul's objective now is for us to be a one mind, one mouth, like-minded, uh, and he's, he's, he's given us instructions on how we could do that, and he's going to come back to this in Romans 16, verses 19 and 20, and we will address that when we come there. So let's look at verses 8 through 13 as we continue on in Romans, the 15th chapter. He says, now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises Sorry. To confirm the promises made to the fathers, and, the, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Verse 10. And again he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Verse 11. Again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Lord him, all you peoples. Verse 12. Again, Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So now Paul is saying, you know, Jesus came as a servant, as a minister to the circumcision, meaning to the Jewish people. To confirm the truth and to fulfill everything that had been spoken in the Old Testament by the prophets. He came and he fulfilled all of that to the Jewish people, but he also came for the Gentiles. And then Paul quotes about four or five scriptures from the Old Testament, all telling us that in the Old Testament it is foretold that even the Gentiles will worship the living God. Amen? So the gospel coming to the Gentiles is not a New Testament thing. It was already prophesied, already spoken of in the Old Testament. And Jesus Christ came to fulfill the word spoken to the Jewish people. And he also came to be uh, the, the gospel, be the answer to the Gentiles. I want you to look at verse 13 there. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy, peace, and hope through believing by the power of the Holy Spirit. So one of the workings of the Holy Spirit in our lives is what? It results in you and me being full of joy, peace, and hope. 
So when we talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, yeah, we talk about signs, we talk about miracles, we talk about demonstrations of power. That is definitely right. But also understand that the power of the Holy Spirit working in us fills us with joy, peace, and hope. So say this with me. I am full. Paul actually says overflowing. So I'm overflowing with joy, with peace, with hope. Through believing. And by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, if you are full of that, then you have no room for doubt, for depression, for confusion, for disturbance. You have no room because you're full of joy, peace, and hope. You're so full of it, there's no room for anything else. Amen? But how does it happen? Through believing. You and I believe. We believe the word. We believe who Christ is. We believe his promises. Through believing, the Holy Spirit has come to empower you and me so that you and I could be full of joy, peace, and hope. Amen? So if you're so full of it, hey, there's no room for the negatives. Amen? So might as well say that. <laughs> Let's say it together. There's no room for the negatives in my life. Because I'm full. I'm overflowing with joy, with peace, with hope. Somebody's full of hope, no depression. <laughs> Somebody's full of peace. There is no confusion, no disturbance. Those are evil things. I'm full of peace. But I believe... And the Holy Spirit fills you and me with that. Amen? That's the kind of people you're supposed to be. And that's what's available to us. So you make that your declaration. You make that your possession. Of course, there will be things that come to disturb your joy. Or disturb your peace. Or disturb your hope. Those things will come. I mean, it's, it's just normal. When a storm comes, it's normal to feel a little afraid. Uh, yeah, but don't lose your joy. Don't lose hope. Don't lose peace. It's yours through the power of the Holy Spirit. And you can be full of it, meaning you don't have to give any of these other things place in your life. Let's move on. Now, verses 14 through 21, Paul begins to talk a little bit about his own uh, ministry. Uh, he says, verse 14 onwards, Now I myself am confident among concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I've written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus and the things which pertain to God, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. So Paul is getting into a little bit about his own ministry. But look closely at verse 14. He's saying, brethren, I mean, he's writing to the community of believers in Rome. He says, brethren, I want you to be, f I want three things to happen. I want you to be full of goodness, filled with all Knowledge and able to, what? Admonish one another. So he says, brethren, be full of goodness. It means be good to each other. Be kind to each other. Full of goodness. I mean, imagine if APC is full of, come on, <laughs> you think we can? <laughs> Just imagine if APC is full of, goodness. I mean, it will draw a lot of people in. Don't you think so? So like, I like to go to that place. It's really good. Because the people are full of goodness. 
and be filled with knowledge. Of course, we need to know the things of God. We need to be filled with the knowledge of the Lord and knowing the Word of God. So we spend time doing that. But he also says, able to admonish one another. That word admonish literally means to warn, to lovingly correct. So can you imagine a people where we are all free to lovingly correct one another? Ouch. Do you think it can happen? You know, I think we need to change a little bit of the way we think. Let's give each other permission to correct each other. How dare he? I've been in the Lord for 40 years. <laughs> He's been in the Lord for four years. How can he come and admonish me? We've got attitude, right? <laughs> Listen, Paul is saying, he's writing to the brethren. He says, brethren, I want you to be full of goodness. I want you to be filled with knowledge, but also be able to admonish one, lovingly correct. You see, don't let a loving correction coming to you offend you. Have the capacity to receive correction. It's only when you do, and I don't have the capacity to receive correction that an offense comes. So correction was never intended to offend you. It was to build you up. But if you don't have the capacity to receive correction, it becomes an offense. Not to the other person, but to you. But what kind of a community are we supposed to be? We are supposed to be people full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. When somebody corrects you, Ask God to give you the grace to say, thank you. You did me good. You did me good. Amen? Instead of letting it become an offense, let it become a blessing. The choice is on the receiving side, not the giving side. I mean, giving side, of course, you need to do it in love. You need to do it as gently as you can, of course. But on the receiving side is what determines whether it's going to become an offense or whether it's going to become a blessing. But we need to be a community that are able to admonish one another. And then Paul goes on to talk about his ministry. He says, you know, I, 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 I'm bold to speak of some things. Things which God has worked through my life. And he says, God has put grace on my life to be a minister of the gospel to the Gentiles. And, and then Paul begins to talk about that. You see, you and I can be bold to talk about the things that flow out of the grace of God given to each one of us. Each one of us has been given grace. There is grace on your life given to you by God to be someone and to do something. Paul was called to be an apostle and he went out to uh, bearing the gospel to the Gentile world. God's grace is on your life to be somebody and to do something for his kingdom. Don't let that grace be wasted. Amen? Don't let it be, don't let it be wasted. It's there on you. And then you can be bold to talk about that. Paul said, I will be bold to talk about the things that God has done through my life. What has he done? He's made the Gentiles, he's used me to make the Gentiles obedient to the gospel of Christ through in word and deed. And I just want to emphasize a little bit on that. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is to be proclaimed in word and deed. That deed there is not social work. There's nothing wrong with social work. But the deed that Paul is talking about is mighty signs and wonders and miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit. I even, and that's the way the gospel is to be proclaimed. And that's why you and I as a church, you, can, you, you see this happening, although we're doing it in a very slow and gentle way, in a nice way, so we can take us all into it. But you keep hearing us talking about moving into that realm of signs, wonders, miracles of doing that because that's the way the gospel is to be proclaimed in word and deed in mighty signs wonders and miracles and we are going there so tell your neighbor we are going there amen we want to be that kind of a church where signs wonders and miracles will be normal amen 
Now, we are doing it in a loving way because all of us come from so many different backgrounds. And so slowly and gently we're making this trip, but that's where we are going. You know, I know I can say this, you know, maybe 10 years ago, uh, when you talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, people are like, what is the pastor talking about? But now, more or less, hopefully, we've all adjusted to that. Right? We know, we can, we have it every other week, every other month, we baptize the Holy Spirit, pray in tongues, prophecy. And so, to the weekend schools, we're trying to equip the people of God in the gifts of the Spirit, in the prophetic, in the supernatural, because that's the normal part of our Christian life. For some reason, we've let it out. But you know, we've got to bring it back. Amen? We've got to walk in what God has made available to us. And that's what Paul did. He preached the gospel in word and deed, which is signs, wonders, and mighty miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he made it his aim to preach where Christ was not named. Let's go now. Uh, to verses 22 to 33. So he's talking about his plans to visit Rome. Verse 22 onwards. For this reason I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now no longer having a place in these parts. And having a great desire these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey. And to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I'm going to Jerusalem and to, to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of the spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this deed and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that it may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So Paul is talking a little bit about his travel plans. He's saying at that time, and Paul was writing this letter, he was traveling up and down through two districts, which is Macedonia and Achaia. The district of Macedonia, we're talking about the eastern part of, the, uh, 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 of Europe. Macedonia had all these towns of Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, that you may be familiar with. Then when you come down south, you come into the district of Achaia, where you have Corinth, and then you have Athens, not too far from there. So Paul was traveling in these parts uh, on his missionary journey. He's writing to the believers at Rome most likely from Corinth, and he's saying, you know, these are my plans. I, I need to take this offering that we've collected. I need to take it back to Jerusalem. From Jerusalem, I really want to go up all the way to Spain. I want to preach the gospel in Spain, but on the way, I plan to make a stop at Rome, spend some time with you, uh, be refreshed, uh, come to you the fullness of the blessing of God, of the gospel, impart some spiritual gift to you, and then I want, I will make my way on to Spain. What I want to bring our attention to is what Paul writes here in Verse 13, he says, I, I, I'm requesting this from you, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. Strive with me. You partner with me in this battle. So it's not like, you know, uh, the, 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 the picture is one of intensity. Strive with me by praying for me. Are you getting it? Strive with me. You partner with me in this conflict. You partner with me in this fight that I'm fighting. How? By praying for me. You see, this is what we do when we pray for each other. You, you know a brother or a sister, somebody who's going through something in life. There's a conflict going on. When you pray for them, what are you doing? You're striving to Together with them in their battle. You've stepped into their fight and you are in the conflict with them. Their strength has been reinforced because you are praying for them. Amen? And if a man like the Apostle Paul is saying, can you please do this for me? Surely you and I need some of that for ourselves. 
and we can do it for each other. Amen? Now, I'm not saying now go get the church directory and try to pray for every person in church. That's not it. Get a few of your friends. Get the people that you know, that you care about, and you pray for them in whatever area of conflict, whatever their struggle is. When you do that, you are striving together with them when you pray for them. Are you with me? And that's how we reinforce each other. That's how we come alongside each other because we are in spiritual conflict. We are in a battle against an adversary. We can't deny that. We've got to fight the good fight of faith, but we need each other. And as we pray for each other, we are striving together. Amen? Now, just expand that in striving together for the vision and the mission and the purpose that's upon us as a body. If we all join together and pray for that, what are we doing? We are like one big army fighting together towards that. Do you understand? We are striving together for that. Now imagine if we all join together and pray for our nation. Not just us, but believers across churches. We join together and we pray next year, election. God, we are praying. We are a huge army striving together. In the spiritual realm. Amen? So Sunday mornings, we didn't do it this Sunday because we had communion. But other Sundays, we come. And we take some time to pray for our church. We take some time to pray for the city. We take some time to pray for our nation. We make declarations. We do all of that. You know, that's the time we are striving together. Where we are in battle together. It's very important. We can make a difference in our nation. Amen? But we got to strive together as we pray for something together. Let's go now to chapter 16. Chapter 16 is just the conclusion of uh, his letter. Verses 1 through 16. I'll read the whole passage. Jesus is greeting a number of people. Uh, please pardon me if I don't pronounce their names right or read their names right, but just, just run through this passage. He says, verse 1 onwards, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in St. Cancria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia, to Christ. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. And then he greets several other people all the way, and I'll just skip down to verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. I want to just highlight a few things. In, in verses 1 and 2, he's mentioning a lady named Phoebe. And she is a deacon. She used the, he used the word minister or deacon. I mean, she is involved in the ministry of the church. So ladies, you can be involved in the ministry of the church. Don't leave it all to the men. Nobody's saying amen. <laughs> right? This was Phoebe, and Paul is recommending her. He says, like, you know, just allow her to do what she's come to do. Uh, she's in charge of some, maybe some of the administrative organizational things. He calls it the business of the church. And he says, you know, she's been a great blessing to Paul and even to many other church, many other people. Right? Then Paul makes mention of Priscilla and Aquila. And uh, oh, one of the things that stand out in this passage is Paul is thankful for people that, who have worked with him. I mean, he doesn't take people for granted. And I want to say the same thing to, you know, to all of us uh, who are serving here at APC. You know, we are thankful to you. Across our locations, we have literally, uh, I don't know the current, current number, but it's somewhere like 300, 350 volunteers who serve. Volunteers. They're serving. 
350 volunteers. They don't get paid. But they come. Some of them come here at 6 o'clock in the morning or 6.30 in the morning to set up. They volunteer their time, their energy, their skill. So many different things. I want you to know we appreciate you. We are thankful to God for you. Amen? And Paul in his letters, he's mentioning people by name. He's thanking them. He's thanking them Priscilla and Aquila. They worked with him in Corinth. Their life was at risk. So I thank them. You know, and thank other people who are serving. Let me go on to the next part of this letter here. Verse, verse 17 to 20. This is the part I want us to spend a few minutes on. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I'm glad on your behalf. But I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Now, he's coming back to that same thought. In chapter 15, verse 1, as he, uh, the first seven verses that we read, he said, I want you to be of one mind. I want you to be like-minded. I want you to have one mouth to glorify Jesus. Now, before he concludes, he's coming back to the same thing. He says, brothers, I want you to avoid people who are causing divisions and offenses. Avoid that. That means, how do they do it? Next verse. He says, you know, they are people who are really not serving Jesus, but they're actually serving their own selfish interests. When he says serving their own belly, don't just think about eating food. <laughs> the point that that figure of speech is they are serving their own selfish interests, their own desires. And how do they do it? By flattering words and smooth words. So they talk very nicely. But they can deceive those who are very simple. That means people who are not discerning. And what do they do with those words, those simple words? He's saying they cause division and offense. Two things to avoid. So let's be on guard. If somebody starts talking to you, hey, you know this brother... You know, speak somebody's name. Ah, you know, he does this, he does that. Hey, remember these two verses. Smooth, flattering words. Trying to bring division and offense. Don't be simple in that matter. Paul says, be wise. In, and and. And be innocent of evil, but be wise towards what is good. You've got to know. Hey, don't fall for those smooth words, flattering words. No. This is actually promoting division and offense. Don't let those words deceive you. You've got to call it what it is. You've got to guard against it. See, nobody's going to come and tell you, hey, I'm going to put, try to put division between Nah, Suhas and Renatus. So let me tell you. No, it's not going to happen that way. It's going to come like, hey, Suhas. You know, Renatus is a good guy, actually. But you know, but. <laughs> but. Got to be careful. So it's smooth and flattering words. But if, it, if, if Suhas, again, I don't know why I keep picking on Suhas. <laughs> Let's pick somebody else. <laughs> but if Suhas is not careful, then he might start thinking wrong about Renatus. Either it's going to divide them or Suhas is going to carry an offense. Oh, uh, but Suhas, you know, Renatus, the other day, he mentioned that you always wear shorts to church. <laughs> and 
He really has a problem with it. Do you know that, Suhas? Now, <laughs> so Amy is saying, don't. <laughs> so, uh, so if Suhas is not careful to guard his heart, those smooth and flattering words will begin to bring division, deceive his heart. And he'll be holding something, offense against Renatus. And why did he say that? Maybe he really doesn't like me. Maybe he's got issues. Oh. What does Paul say? Avoid those who cause division and offense. I mean, so you don't participate. And they say, thank you. I'm switching off. I don't want to be a part of this conversation. Sorry. Let it stop here. But why is that important? So Paul commends the believers in Rome. He says, you know, guys, I know you're all obedient people, but I want you to, I'm, I'm saying these things because I want you to be wise about, uh, about what is good. And I want you to, be, I don't want you to, you know, uh, to, to be kept, taken away by evil. Because why? Verse 620. If you do what I'm saying, this is what you'll enjoy. The God of peace will crush Satan underneath your feet. Now let's think about this. On the cross, Jesus already defeated the devil. That work is done. The enemy is destroyed. The enemy has been crushed. Uh, the enemy has been disarmed. The enemy has been expelled. Uh, the enemy has been cast. All that are descriptors of what Christ accomplished for us on Calvary's cross. And yet, why is the church so defeated? Because of this. But Paul says, if you guard against division offense, then you'll be this community who will see God crush Satan underneath your so my question is, do we want to be such a community? Do we want to be a people who can tell everyone else, hey, you come here and see, we've got the devil underneath our feet. He's not behind us, he's under us. And we are actually, in day-to-day -day life, we are demonstrating Christ's victory in every area. We are walking in the finished work of Christ on the cross. We are walking in that victory. Satan lies crushed underneath our feet. But how is that possible when you guard against division and When we all are like-minded, one mind, one mouth. So now you understand. Why it's so important. If we want to be a people who will see Satan crushed underneath our feet, this is key. But let's guard unity. Unity does not mean that we all have the same preferences. We all have different tastes. Like we, we saw Paul go through it in chapters 13 and 14. But we learn to respect one another. We learn to receive one another. We learn to be pleasing to one another. We learn to be people full of goodness. We are walking according to knowledge of the word of God. We learn to care, carry one another's burdens. We learn to edify one another. And when we do those things intentionally, we will be a people who will avoid division, will avoid offense and we will see Satan crushed underneath our feet. Amen? So, Paul closes this episode, last few verses, we'll just read and close. He now sends greetings from his co-workers, verses 21 to 24. He says, Timothy, my fellow worker, uh, Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, my countrymen greet you, and all of the others. He's staying with Gaius, verse 23, Gaius, my host, he's a man in Corinth. So he's staying in his house, and he's, they send greetings. Uh, Erastus, who is the treasurer of the city, is with them. And uh, then he gives the benediction, verses 25 to 27. Now to him is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery that has been kept secret from the time the world began. But now is made manifest. And by the prophetic scriptures is made known to all nations. According to the commandment of the everlasting God. For obedience to the faith. To God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Amen. Let's call our worship team up please.
Let's take a few moments to pray. And just look to the Lord this morning and say, God, you're the God of hope. You're the source of hope. You're the source of joy. You're the source of peace. Help me to be in that place of believing so that I can be filled with joy, peace, hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to take a few moments to pray. If you've come in this morning with heaviness and confusion in your mind, if you've come in this morning with, with your peace disturbed, if you've come in this morning with sadness and heaviness, as we take this few moments, receive from the Holy Spirit His joy, His peace, His hope. Through believing, you say, God, I believe your promise. Take a hold of His word in whatever area of your life you feel disturbed. Take a hold of His word. Say, God, I believe. I receive. Fullness, overflowing joy, overflowing peace, hope that fills me completely. I receive God. Thank you, Father. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.